In today's programme, taking stock of the Spanish presidency, we report on six months of a bumpy ride for Mr Zapatero. As the holiday season gets underway, MEPs turn their thoughts to improving passengers' rights by land and sea. And toughening up supervision of the financial markets, why Parliament thinks it's too important to leave to the member states. Hello and welcome to this edition of Europal TV News. We begin with the Spanish presidency of the EU. There's probably no such thing as an easy six months in politics, but Madrid has had to, to cope with an economic downturn and a new form of power sharing. Jim Gibbons looks back at a tough half year. The media have criticised Spain's Prime Minister for his low-profile presidency of the European Council, but he's been the first to share the role with a permanent president, Herman van Rompuy. They've had to work out a satisfactory coexistence, and power sharing's never easy. Of course, this is not an easy exercise to find the right balance, but I strongly believe, and that was also in one of the commissions, right and left has to keep together to have a European vision. There was disappointment when US President Barack Obama decided not to attend February's EU-US summit in Madrid, although he met José Luis Rodríguez Zapatero later in Pittsburgh. That meeting was to discuss the financial crisis which overshadowed Spain's presidency while its own economy looked shaky. But Mr Zapatero takes a positive view. El Trato de Lisboa. The Lisbon Treaty is working and we have made it work. And the Economic Union is making progress, we have made it make progress. That's the Spanish presidency for you. So what did Mr Zapatero achieve? Among other things, Spain negotiated new financial regulations, implemented the Lisbon Treaty, removed the obstacles to the External Action Service, tackled domestic violence, held summits with third countries and got agreement on air travel with the United States. No one can deny that the circumstances surrounding Spain's presidency were especially difficult. Some MEPs fear, though, it may be more difficult now that Belgium's in charge with only an interim government. As Mr. Van Rompuy knows the governance and functioning of his country so well, I'd like to propose that he writes out a set of rules for Belgium's presidency to follow. Otherwise, Mr. Dahl fears, people may come to look back on Spain's presidency as a golden age. After the Icelandic volcano, Europeans are much more aware of their rights as plane and train passengers. And boat and ferry users will soon enjoy similar, to rights, to the, similar rights to those in the air. But the rules for bus and coach travellers are still very much under discussion. This from Arno de Molder and Joanna Gill. Like one in three EU citizens, you may be taking a bus or a coach to transport you to your holiday destination. But delays, accidents and lack of access can all put a dampener on your departure. MEPs voted to give the same charter of rights as air passengers, but it caused much turbulence with the member states. National transport ministers want to exclude regional bus services from the laws. Some MEPs defend the exemption. I approve of this solution because most of these services are covered by a public service contract. So, in my opinion, we should support the member states to have an exemption. Disabled rights are also causing a stir in the member states. Parliament doesn't want to stop these passengers from travelling. They also want to provide training for staff, for bus drivers often operate alone and are not always able to attend to people with reduced mobility. Uh, we do believe in order to include everyone um, uh, within the society, it is important to provide the right conditions for disabled persons. If your bus or coach is delayed, MEPs want the companies to cough up if the situation could have been avoided. It's not only a question of money, it's also the position of the different member states. Every state has a different reality, and it's not the same in France as it is in Germany or Spain. With a new presidency, MEPs hope it may speed up matters. I hope the Belgian presidency will act as a better interlocutor for these negotiations. It looks like bus and coach passengers will encounter further delays in strengthening their rights, as the issue will go to conciliation between Parliament and Transport Ministers only this autumn. Time for today's guest. Parliament's taking a tough line on plans to beef up supervision of the financial markets in the wake of the banking crash. So, earlier this afternoon, I spoke to Sylvie Goulard, French Liberal Democrat and rapporteur on oversight of the financial system. 
Sylvie Goulard, why should financial markets be regulated at EU level rather than just left to national member states? Well, we have experienced a very severe crisis in which we have seen, for example, banks acting in different member states. And when there is a problem, nobody knows who is in charge of uh, supervising them. So the purpose of this legislation is not to supervise all the markets, all the banks, all the insurance companies at the European level, not at all, but to make sure that the ones working and making business at the European level with no borders accept to be regulated at the right level. So you want to go into the boardrooms, as it were, of the banks which are operating cross-border and tell them what they can and can't do? Well, what is the other solution? It's Regulate it at can... national level. Leave it, for example, to well, the Bank of England in, yes, uh, in and, London. Yes, and when you have a bank uh, acting in many member states and the national supervisory authorities disagree, then you are uh, in, in a situation in which you have no decision, which might be very uh, risky for the economy. I remind you that we have already experienced these cases with Fortis, for example. And what do you say to those who argue if you're too heavy-handed with this regulation, all the business will just go to the Far East? It's a very good point. Uh, we, have to, to, we have to take it into account, but look at what is just happening in the United States. The United States have not given up their right to regulate and supervise the, the activity based in the U.S. Of course, we have to think global. We have not to go too far, but on the other hand, we should make sure that in this sector, the services, the financial services, where Europe is very strong, uh, the investors feel safe when they invest in Europe. And to member states such as the UK, which say, we're not going to let this happen? It's a single market issue. I would recommend the British government to read the Turner report published by the FSA uh, one year ago, which is clearly showing that if we do not go in the direction of some European supervision, and once again, some European supervision at the right level for some specific cases, then we only have going to have national supervision, and it will mean a fragmentation of the single market. As far as I know, even the conservatives in the UK have never been against the single market. Sylvie Goulard, thank you very much indeed. And the news came later this afternoon that the main vote on supervision will be pushed back to September. Now the headlines. Kosovo in the spotlight. The recent upsurge in violence in the former Serb province is causing concern. European Council President von Rompuy visited Kosovo today while on his first tour of the Balkans. The weekend's incidents also prompted an extraordinary session of the UN Security Council today. The European Parliament will debate the situation in plenary tomorrow. Waste not, want not. Welcoming a European Commission green paper on the management of bio-waste, members voted for a report that calls to now proceed to legislation. A directive should guarantee the recycling of bio-waste for composting and fuel generation. This would also create new green jobs, they believe. Estimates put the EU's annual amount of bio-waste at up to 140 million tonnes. Youth in Peril, a report by the youngest member of parliament on promoting the access of young people to the labour market, was also adopted in plenary today. It calls for the creation of a European quality charter for internships and an EU-wide guarantee giving young persons a right to either work, training or education after four months of unemployment. Today, 5.5 million young people under 25 are unemployed, twice the overall unemployment rate. And finally, petitions. Any European citizen can bring a petition before the Parliament, and about 1,500 people a year make the effort to do so. This report, compiled by Hugh Wanstock, takes us to Spain. Enrique Yuk is a Spanish farmer who brought his battle to the Petitions Committee of the European Parliament. Enrique, dispossessed of his land, thinks that the regional urban planning law has flouted his right to property. The Parliament agreed with him and even threatened to suspend the payment of European funds to Spain until the problems of urban planning by the seaside have been solved. People in Spain have got a very good feeling that the Parliament uh, cares for their, their problems, that we uh, don't uh, accept bad legislation, we don't accept uh, bad uh, core, uh, uh, court of justice practices, uh, that we really want that uh, human rights should be respected. Enrique isn't the only one to have called out the MEPs. In 2009 the Parliament received 1,924 petitions from all over Europe, 4% more than in 2008. Almost half of these petitions were deemed admissible. 
This means also that we've pursued a good information policy, which has allowed citizens to distinguish between questions of European law and questions of national competence. As for the petitions that were deemed inadmissible, MEPs today voiced their support for a special information portal that would guide citizens in the future. The idea behind it is to gain time and to allow the petitions committee to function more efficiently. That's it for now. Thanks for watching and see you next time.